Is this on? Okay, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone to the next chapter. Glad you came out on a cold, blustery night. Seems like every next chapter has had weather issues. Too hot, too cold, raining, snowing. Uh, so we've got another cold one here. But this is going to be a wonderful presentation and glad you're here. And the plan for tonight is Marianne's going to give her presentation for about an hour. Then there'll be some Q&A. We'll wander around with microphones. And then we've got fellowship and refreshments. And a lot of us stayed up very late last night baking. So I hope that you will enjoy that. And uh, so that's good. So I'm trying to think what else. We've got free will offering. We will never charge for next chapter. And there's never a need to register to come. Just come if you can. Uh, all of our presentations are, on, are taped and are on our website. So feel free to invite anyone that wasn't able to come tonight to go view that. So it's a great library. We got Alan Page, we got Will Steger, we got Richard Leiter, a lot of other great presentations. Alan Hilton for people that are part of this church and know Alan, so he, he presented one too. So I think that this presentation is particularly relevant, certainly for me and I'm sure for many of you. You know, aging with resilience mindfully that's certainly something that, that I need. And what I'm hoping is the mindfully will help me with my New Year's resolution. So uh, I've have always struggled with that. And like a lot of people, I, I always watch the, I used to watch the ball drop in Times Square. And after about four or five years, I realized, you know, watching a ball drop just reminds me of what I spent the whole last year doing, you know, dropping the ball. So. So I can't do that anymore. And this year, like always, I've said, you know, I really want to increase the amount I read. And I've never been able to do that until somebody last week said, you can do closed captioning on your TV <laughs> and, and read. So check, check for that. And I'm always trying to lose weight, so I try to set a modest goal. So this year, on January 1st, I said, I want to lose 15 pounds and I'm only 20 pounds away from achieving that. So, <laughs> so that's pretty good. So that's, let me introduce Marianne. Sorry for all of that uh, stuff. But so aging with resilience mindfully, Marianne is a tremendously accomplished speaker, author, uh, instructor, and uh, she started her career uh, working in the corporate world as a development consultant. So she's worked with Fortune 500 companies, not-for-profits, organizations. And then she's been at the U for how long? All right. So she's part of the Bakken Center for Spirituality and, uh, and he healing, I think, is the last of it. So it's going to be exciting. And I guess without further ado, I'm going to introduce Marianne. Let's welcome her. Thank you so much, Jim. It's kind of hard to follow somebody who has really good jokes. I, I can't say that I have them, but I'm really happy to be here with you, and I'm really impressed that all of you came out tonight. I was driving here thinking, I wonder if this cold and snow will keep people away, but then I remembered we're diehard Minnesotans, so I'm, I'm glad you, you proved your resilience, and here you are tonight, so I'm just really pleased to be here. So, um, yes. Uh, I am going to speak about aging with resilience mindfully, and the mindfulness part is that at the Bakken Center, my primary role is working with mindfulness programs and well-being programs, working with healthcare providers and leaders, many of whom have gone through a really, really rough time, like many people over the past few years. Um, so I'm going to flavor this presentation with a model we have at the center, a six-dimensional model of well-being. Did any of you by any chance attend one of these that was done by Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer, my colleague at the center and founder? Well, good, because I won't cover that part as in-depth, the well-being model, since you had it from the maestro herself who actually created that model, but I'll touch on it a little bit because everything that we do at the center is based on that. But my, um, my uh, richest background uh, in teaching at the center is really mindfulness. Before I started uh, doing the other work I do there uh, full-time, I taught mindfulness-based stress reduction 
uh, MBSR. Some of you may be familiar with John Kabat-Zinn's work, yes. So I'm certified in that from Brown University. So that's, I'm bringing that expertise and some other things tonight. Just wanted to, to kind of flavor that. And my own mindfulness practice of over, should I say how many years? Yeah, it's over 25 years, and I think it's really approaching 30, but you know, you're really old when you start rattling off numbers like that. So here's what I thought we'd cover tonight. Uh, as I said, I want to talk about well-being and resilience, and I really want to focus on that, especially as we age. One of the, the projects that I did a few years ago before uh, landing full-time at the U was um, I worked for United Health Group for a period of time, helping them create mindfulness programs for their employees and, and physicians and, and other folks. And as part of that, I actually did a research project called, guess what, Aging with Resilience. Uh, and it was with AARP, and we took several people through a six-week program. Um, and so some of those findings I'll share with you and some other research as well as we go uh, so that we can um, get that, uh, understand it from a little different perspective as well. So I'll also talk about what mindfulness is and isn't. How many meditation or even maybe dabbled in mindfulness or tried meditation before? Not a requirement for being here tonight, by the way. Um, so I wanted to find from our perspective at the U and I think a pretty well accepted definition of what mindfulness is and isn't. In case you haven't noticed, it's rather ubiquitous these days. I tell people that it wasn't too long ago I was at Target and I found a soap called Mindful Soap. And I was like, oh, wow, even soap. So I, I don't know. But, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about mindfulness. And I'd also like to practice a little towards the end or a little later in our session, uh, a little mindfulness meditation exercise. Would you guys be all right with that? A, a little experiential piece. And for any reason that doesn't feel right for you, I enjoy you just to sit in silence. When do we ever get that? So one way or the other, it's an invitation there. And then I want to talk about some really practical tips and things we can do. And um, I like to start a session with what I want to call like a purposeful pause or just a moment to arrive. How many of you rushed out the door to get here or felt a little finagled, you know, just trying to get it all together? So maybe uh, we can all just fully arrive. We lose a lot of energy throughout the day and a lot of mindfulness in our transitions from one thing to the other. Have you ever noticed that? You sit down and all of a sudden you're still thinking about what you just came from or you're already on to the next thing in your mind. So I'm just going to invite us all to smile at human nature and the brain doing what it does and maybe give that a little smile and maybe feel your feet on the floor, take a couple of breaths and really invite yourself this invitation uh, to really be here now, tonight. And the truth is, I always do that just as much for me as I do it for you. All right, so we're going to start with a little bit about well-being. Uh, and I always like to start with what you know because that's actually most important. So I'd like you maybe just to turn to somebody who's sitting next to you if you'd be willing to do that. Maybe just turn around or something that's easy for you and just share from your own experience. When do you experience well-being? And I'm going to let you define that broadly. I'll just say that and one way to look at it is a sense of contentment, right? A, a, a little lightness in one's life. So let's just keep it really broad and let you define it. But when you feel kind of all hands on deck or sense of happiness maybe, contentment. So if you just want to speak with each other, when does that show up for you in your life? When do you experience it?
I'll give you another uh, couple of minutes to uh, complete this. I hope it's enough time to at least share some ideas. <clears throat> I'm going to give you uh, just a little bit maybe to wrap up your conversation. Maybe thank your partner. I've seen some of you already do that and say, nice to meet you. All right. So I'd love to just hear, a, a, I won't be able to hear from all of you, but maybe just a sampling. What are some things that came out when you talked about uh, when do you experience well-being? What showed up for you in your conversations? Can't flunk this, by the way. Being outside, yeah. How many of you noticed you were outside a lot more, for example, at the heart of the pandemic? Remember that? When we, yeah. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about nature, and that's a theme that we'll come back to. What else? When do you experience well-being? Pardon me? When you're... Wood carving. Wow, cool. I thought you were saying gardening. Wood carving, yeah, hobby, something that's creative. A lot of people will talk about that sense of well-being, also mindfulness, that when they're doing something they love and they're putting their all into it, they're so present to it, whether it's wood carving or gardening or cooking or whatever it is, you know, we're kind of all there uh, in it. So thank you for that. What else? Yeah. Oh. Falling into bed at night after a busy day, the pillow, yes, that's lovely. That sense of ease and relaxation and maybe uh, grateful for a good day gone by and really grateful for that pillow probably too. That's good. Great. What else? Anything else? Please. How many noticed our, our SAD syndrome releasing this morning when that sun came out? Yeah, yeah. What else? Yeah, when things around your life and, and people around you are doing okay. And I'm, I'm really glad because I have a feeling that many of you talked about relationships and family and stuff like that too. And, and usually relationships are really paramount to us in terms of our well-being, too. We're, we're social creatures. We're hardwired that way. So, yeah. Anybody else want to name one that hasn't been? Please. So, this sounds kind of cruddy, but I like it when everything is where it should be in terms of put away, neat. I don't like messes. Cool. I love this because this is really important. So you like things that are in their place and organized in an environment that for you um, makes you feel at ease. Is that a fair way to say that? Yeah. So I'm so glad that you said that. And you know, you started out, well, maybe other people or whatever, you know. But the thing to remember about this is regardless of whatever else we talk about tonight, don't forget this, what you what brings about a sense of well-being for you in your life? And, you know, we usually create on our calendar those really important appointments, right? We put them in. And, and I want to invite you to think about the things that bring about well-being for you that you know are restorative for you and make you feel alive, that sense of contentment or, or, or at ease with your life. Um, one of the things maybe to do is to just say, where am I introducing that a little bit more in my life? And when can I, when it does happen and I feel that head on my pillow, or when I'm in my, my workshop, maybe a sense of gratitude, right? Just let's call it savoring those moments too, all right? Okay, well, thank you.
Those are really helpful. And when I show you, uh, here's some, I'm not gonna go into this too much other than to just screen this for you to say, these are some definitions, some descriptions, some descriptions is when we talk about well-being at the center. Um, uh, there's this sense of being in alignment. I like to call it alignment better than balance because sometimes I think balance is like this thing where we think everything has to be, you know, 50-50 or something. But in alignment, body, mind, and spirit, uh, and that we're engaged that way. Contentment and harmony, safe. A sense of, you might not have thought about that, but a sense of safety is brought about generally when we've got that psychological safety and a sense of interconnected with, with the world around us. Uh, and when we talk about well-being at the center, we use this when we work with communities, we work with organizations will use us as a model, and real importantly, sitting here today, we use this as a model for personal well-being as well. And I just want to touch on these six dimensions of well-being, this model that we've been using now for over 25 years at the center. The first is physical, you know, and that's uh, your physical health, your mental health, uh, caring for ourselves. Um, this is kind of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I guess we could say, you know, the root of it all, taking care of ourselves and, and having a sense of well-being physically and mentally is really important to us. This also has to do with emotional well-being. And I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into these in a minute and tie these in with resilience. Uh, the next one is relationships. Uh, we like to say at the center that we know that isolation uh, is fatal. Um, and if you've been following uh, the United States government, our, uh, several of our leaders will talk about isolation as being a, uh, an epidemic right now in America. And the earlier studies on isolation and their impact were done on those of us who were close to retirement, right? And that sense of isolation there. Well, guess what? We have found extreme levels of isolation in our college age students, the people, the kids at the University of Minnesota. It's something that we're working on uh, quite a bit now. Uh, we are live in a time where when you look at social media and, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, X, is that what it's called now? And our, our phones and easy connections. We're more connected than we ever are. We've ever been, excuse me. More connected than we've ever been. And yet many of us are experiencing more isolation than we ever have before. Something for us to really think about. And uh, many of us are working on that. And by the way, when we talk about relationships, we're not talking about the need for us to have the large quantity of friends. We're talking about quality of connection. Um, and uh, some of the data tells us that if, if we have just a couple of people in our lives that we can share in more deep ways how we're feeling, you know, uh, emotionally connect with, that that can be really powerful and an antidote, if you will, to that sense of isolation. How many of you have cats and dogs? And how many of you have a connection, a relationship with those cats and dogs that are emotional? We include pets in this dimension quite legitimately, I might add, right? Uh, and then uh, as we move along, we'll talk about safety here, that third dimension that you see up there in security. Safety and security uh, clearly is, am I safe in my home? Do I have enough food to eat? Uh, do I feel safe in my community? Do I have enough financial resources to know that I can navigate the world safely? So those, those needs are really important too. But also in this safety and security is psychological safety. Can I show up fully as to who I am as a human being, fully who I am, my, all my dimensions, the intersectionality of it all, can I show up in my communities, in my schools, in my churches? Uh, psychological safety uh, being really important as well. And then the next dimension is purpose. Purpose and meaning. I know you had Richard Leiter here at one point talking to you about purpose. Uh, he's one of our fellows at the Bakken Center at the University of Minnesota. But what I want to say about purpose and meaning is probably uh, supporting what Richard said, but purpose really matters. As we look at some of the data and aging, we find that it can add up to seven years on one's life, having a sense of purpose and meaning. 
that isolation figure, by the way, uh, some data on that, and some of you may be familiar with this, experiencing isolation over extended periods of time can be like smoking 15 cigarettes a day and take as much as five years or more off your longevity. So there, these, there are consequences to uh, not adhering to things that we know bring about well-being and resilience in our own life. Um, the next one is community. And when I think about community, I like to think about a sense of belonging. You know, places that you feel that web of connection with others, if you will. Sometimes that's in your neighborhood. It's you right here, sitting here. This next, next chapter group, you are a community. There's a sense I noticed when some of you are coming in, greeting each other warmly, right? There's that sense of belonging, which is so important to our psychological well-being. Uh, as human beings, we literally need each other from the day we're born till the day that we leave this planet. We emotionally co-regulate with one another. Uh, we need each other uh, on many, many levels throughout the lifespan. And community is that web that binds us and supports us. The last dimension is that of nature. We like to say nature heals. And how many of you in this room know that nature heals? You know, I always laugh when you read a research finding, well, yeah, I ju that just makes logical sense. I kind of knew that one for a long time. I always thought that when I, when I read the data on nature. And uh, the studies, one of the studies that we like to refer to is a study that's done that says being in nature for 30 minutes a day over a 30 year, uh, 30 year, you could do that too, uh, but a 30 day period, um, and they look at biomarkers pre and post that, they'll see uh, improvement in those biomarkers uh, and also uh, psychological indicators of well-being, self-reported and otherwise. So that's pretty interesting. That sunshine matters, that interconnection with nature, the healing balm that many of us get. How many of you ever go out to the Arboretum and when you leave you feel like a whole new person after you've had that walk? Yes, I'm right there with you. So these are things that we know uh, and things that um, uh, we consider to be at the heart of well-being. I also want to suggest to you that we believe that resilience grows out of well-being. So out of the center of that circle, I might have resilience growing out of it. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with the term resiliency, but I thought I'd just share with you. We use the work a lot of Dr. Stephen, Stephen Southwick and his research on resilience as well. And he uh, describes it as this bouncing back uh, after encountering difficulties. And who among us has not encountered difficulties in our lives? It's a mark of being a human being on this planet. Um, Southwick is also... Uh, rather famous for also saying not only is there that ability over time to bounce back, but that we bounce back sometimes even stronger than we were before. How many of you can think of times maybe where you've been through lots of difficulty in your life and you wondered, how am I ever going to get through this? And then a few years later you look back and you realize I'm a completely different person in a much stronger and maybe better way for having lived through that. Do some of you know what I mean by that? I can certainly relate to that. And that was his sense of that. And then uh, the Psychological Association, American Psychological Association, the thing I love about their definition, they talk about it as being a process. We just don't become resilient overnight. You know, we lose our resilience over a period of time and we regain it over a period of time uh, through nurturing ourselves, through, through self-care, uh, and the support and care of others as well. So it's a process. Um, the other thing I want to say about it is that it is an innate capacity. This ability to revitalize. Uh, the other day I was cooking on a, on a, and I was using a knife that was just sharpened. Anyone ever had this problem with a just sharpened knife? And I cut myself right here, as a matter of fact. And I just marveled the next day at how quickly it healed. Like, what a miracle the body is, right? That's a resilient body. Well, we are also resilient. We can be resilient psychologically as well with the right factors, right? We can heal, grow, learn, come back from difficult times. And let's look at some of the factors that we hear about. So I like to call these the usual suspects because whenever you see a healthcare provider, they're the things that they talk about, right? So of course we're gonna hear these. 
I also like to say the other thing when you get to our age that you often hear when you're at the doctor's office, the, one of the first things out of their mouth is, and at your age. And has anyone ever heard that one before? Sorry, I just, I had to give credit to my doctor for that one. All right. So the first is nutrition. We know that. It's, uh, you know, are we eating a well-balanced meal? Are we exercising? Uh, uh, and uh, I, I will say, you know, the mark is 30 minutes. I just want you to know, however, I just saw some research as it, as it applies to aging. And it said that moderate exercise has great benefits to us, particularly as we, as we uh, and I believe it was from the University of Washington, uh, and I think it was published in the Alzheimer's Journal or one of the Alzheimer's Journals, but it said that you can, you don't have to necessarily abide to that thinking of 10,000 steps a day. 4,000 steps a day was also shown in a marked way to enhance people's physical well-being. So moderate exercise, we garden, we do whatever we do. I think the thing, rather than calling it exercise, is just to move, right? To just move your body in ways that work for you as best you can throughout your day. And then sleep, and sleep it's enough, right? Uh, seven to eight hours of sleep is, is something. How many of you uh, have, uh, let me just ask you this. How many of you are familiar with TED Talks? Okay, I don't have time to show you this video, but there is a video on TED Talk um, that's called Sleep is a Superpower. I think it's called that, something like that. Um, all you have to do is Google uh, sleep when you are doing the search engine when you get to TED Talks. I don't get a kickback from uh, TED Talks, by the way. Uh, but we've, we, every time we show this to health professionals, for example, they're like, what? So it's really good, and if, and if you ever need a little inducement to go to bed a little bit earlier, that film might do it. We find out more and more and more the regenerative, not just physically, but mentally, and on our cognitive abilities, our memory, all the rest of that. Sleep is so especially important to us. And then stress mastery. You know, uh, it wasn't that long ago when your doctor was more concerned or your physician or healthcare provider about the nutrition and the sleep and the exercise, and they didn't really ask you about your mental health, right? But now have you noticed more and more you're being asked about that? How, how is stress in your life, and how are you taking care of yourself that way? And then there's the things you might not suspect. Many of these things you saw in one form or another on that well-being meal uh, wheel that you saw. But one of them is this notion of having, particularly as we age, the research tells us that how we view aging and our attitude about it, our psychological framework, has a lot to do with our well-being. Now, this is an audience. I tried the word Pollyanna on a group of students the other day, and I had to describe to them what Pollyanna was like. Yeah, that's when I knew I was old. Um, <laughs> So anyway, this notion of, uh, this isn't a Pollyanna thing when I'm talking about having this positive mental outlook. Of course, we're not always skipping down the road and bouncing up and down, but when we can look at the gifts that come, the wisdom, the, the many different factors that come and the gifts that come with aging and in our relationships as we age, that really is an important factor in terms of our resilience as we age and the ability to regulate challenging emotions, to know that things get tough, and, and how do we regulate those emotions. Our relationships, social connections, sense of community and belonging, that's why this group, I think, is just, when I first heard about this group, I was like, that's so cool. You know, because this is exactly what we need as we age. Groups, communities, opportunities to come together, share our experiences and our richness. Uh, and then again, um, a sense of purpose and meaning. Um, uh, people with purpose and meaning, again, particularly as we age, becomes vitally important. Uh, and um, last night I was telling somebody this story, so I'm going to share this with you. Um, I recently was speaking at an event, and at the end of it, somebody who used to be uh, in charge of a foundation in the, in the area uh, came up to speak to me, and she was a mentor to me, and I was like, oh my goodness. And I said, what are you doing now? And she said, oh, I'm a full-time nanny. And I said, what? She's, and she said, no, seriously, I'm a full-time nanny. And I said, really? She said, yeah, I, I, I left the foundation world when my children started to have a lot of kids, and they couldn't find daycare that was adequate, and I decided 
I can be a nanny. So she's a nanny. And she said, the truth is, don't tell, oh, here, this is going to be televised or whatever or recorded, but don't tell anyone this, but I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life, right? So purpose and meaning take so many different forms. And a lot of the research talks about purpose and meaning as we age we're of, when we're of service to others. I think Richard Leiter talks a lot about that too. Some of you may be familiar with that. But that opportunity to give back and to enrich other people's lives, it's the gift of, of being wiser, of having been around for a while. And sometimes that means just helping your neighbor do something. And sometimes it means volunteering. Sometimes it takes many different dimensions. But that being of service is really linked heavily into that sense of purpose and meaning as we age. I also didn't mention this, but purpose and meaning on the wheel and uh, when we talk about this is also our sense of spirituality. Our sense of, for many of us, religious communities are really important to us as we age. Uh, so let's not forget the power of spirituality, knowing what that means for each of us and replenishing that. Being in community with others around that can be really powerful as well. And then there's self-efficacy. Um, personal agency, right? Uh, and it, it, it is about, you know, the impact that I can have uh, on my own life and a belief in that, uh, a belief in, one, in your own self. I oftentimes talk about it as if uh, having your own back, you know, having your own back. And, and when those times when we know we don't have our own back and, wow, it's really hard to muster that up, we go for support. That's why and is underlined, supports. Because most of us have self-efficacy because we have others in our lives, because there are other resources that help us, because we're not alone, because we know when to reach out. And that enhances that sense of self-efficacy. Um, and so uh, I think I'll just leave that at that, other than just to say what you see up there. And that's that part of that, and particularly as we age, as many of you have probably discovered on your own, um, is that it becomes very important that we know what to let go of, what to say no to, what to let go of, as importantly as it was, as it is to know what we can impact and what we choose to change in our lives. So the categories of usual suspects and what you might not uh, suspect. And I just invite you, we don't have time to do this now, um, but I really invite you to take a reflection sometime. Those of you who like to journal, do it that way. Maybe over a cup of coffee or lunch with a friend or some friends and just talk about those times in your life when uh, you really, your resilience was really tested and what was present that allowed you, you know, what were those strengths, what were those gifts that arose in your life or maybe that you helped co-create that were there. Some people call that a state of grace, right? That kind of carried them through some of those difficult times. But I think to reflect on that can also give us a sense of appreciation, to remember what we can tap into sometimes that we sometimes forget, and also a sense of gratitude, appreciation can often arise from that as well. So now that I've talked about well-being and resilience and all these things, and you knew I asked you that question about what brings it about, you probably figured eventually there was going to be a flip side to that question. So here it is, and I'm just curious. Maybe you can just throw out some ideas. What is it that gets in the way? What gets in the way sometimes? We are human beings. There's a lot of things that get in the way. Somebody just pointed to themselves and said, me. <laughs> Yes, the gremlins, I love that. This, the yakety yak yak yak, that, that, that negative self voice that can kind of come into our brains. Anybody else want to share? A lot of people will talk. Pardon me? The noise, of the, world. the noise of the world, the nightly news, the news feeds with the not so good news right now. Uh, it's, it's been a really tough few years and it's hard right now, yeah. And so those things, of course, the world around us impacts us and our, our stress levels. Uh, physical, challenges. physical challenges, yes, of course, yeah. And, and, and learning how to work with those. Were you going to say something? Fear. Fear, yes. Fear might have something to do with that yakety yak. I'm not sure, but it just might. 
For the sake of time, if I could go around, I'm sure we'd get more. Um, but I just want to say that I'm going to boil it down to stress. Can I do that? Can I just boil it down to stress? And it's, m m you know, many, many, many uh, different forms. And I also want to say that stress, as many of you know, is really just a natural and normal human response to change in perceptions of threat. So the way that we perceive threat, though, can really vary, and that can trigger our central nervous system, which I'll talk about in a minute. But let me just say this. I wouldn't be here speaking to you now, and none of you would be sitting here and having the capability of driving and getting here tonight if your ancestors hadn't been hardwired when that saber-toothed tiger was about to jump out from under the bush. They'd grab the kidlins and everybody else, and they were able to run. Or if they were really strong, maybe they fought them off or whatever they did. But this human organism, this brain, is designed for one purpose, and that's to thrive and survive, and actually survive first and then probably, then probably thrive. So that's how this organism is designed, it's built. And so it's always looking out. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the brain has something called uh, a negativity bias. How many of you are familiar with that? Maybe some of you. In other words, it's constantly scanning the environment for what's missing and what's not working. That's its primary function because it needs to keep you alive, right? It also has another capacity. It doesn't react quite as quickly. It's a little more slow brewing, right? But that's the one that also knows how to downregulate. And I want to talk about that here in just a minute. But I think to understand that we're human, that stress is a normal and natural part of life. And our quest is to, to learn how to work with stress. And I'm just going to show this slide. I talked about this a little bit earlier in honor of Literally, I'm going to call it in honor of all that we've been through the past two, three years and what's going on right now. World, the world around us and the past three years have not been easy for many of us. This is a model I want to show you. This is a, a diagram uh, um, that actually is oftentimes used in the workplace. Can you guys see all that close enough? Yeah. So it, it just talks about, and I just really want to say this and stress this, stress shouldn't be the boogeyman. Right? Because stress, how many of you, uh, maybe when you were in college or, or maybe uh, taking care of someone who's ill now, you've been able to power through with no sleep and get something done or really use adrenaline or those, the gifts of stress to, to get through something that you couldn't have otherwise. You maybe crashed then for a couple days, but you were able to do it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like the strength of this human body and mind to do things that are rather extraordinary. You've heard the stories of the, the, the parent who picked up the car to get the kid, you know, all these miraculous things that our bodies can do. It's pretty amazing. And for most of us, in order to learn and to perform well, this is a workplace model, by the way, for most of us to perform well, we need to feel somewhat of a challenge, right? We do well with challenges, knowing that we've got that there. And so, uh, and stress gets lit up, not to really high doses, but we need that st those hormones, that strength, uh, sense of activity in the body sometimes to give us that challenge. It's when we get a little overboard that we can get ourselves in trouble. So the stress is a psychological, neurological, physiological response all tied together. And you see examples of, of threats there. Of course, the dog, somebody says something to you in a meeting you don't like, and it starts that yakety yak 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 or rumination or what you should have, could have said that you didn't. You guys know what I'm talking about? All these things light off the central nervous system. Uh, thoughts, uh, environmental, psychological safety, all of these things. But something that we don't often think about is the everyday stressors that accumulate in our bodies, our minds, and our heart from things like chronic partial attention. Does anyone know what I mean by that or ever experienced chronic partial attention, right? You know, I don't know if you've ever been at dinner with somebody and they've had the phone there, right? Or actually ta doing, you know, working. Uh, so, and it's not just teenagers, by the way, that do that. I think they get a bad rap when it comes to phones and I'm not knocking phones here. Uh, but what I am suggesting is that we have this propensity to not be all present. And part of that is because these miraculous minds of ours can do all sorts of things, right? 
We think we can multitask, but actually we can't. We live in this hyper-connected world, fear of missing out, all the social media, all the rest of that. You see the stats there for how many times somebody checks their phone, right? That comes from the phone companies themselves, by the way. So what happens when you're at your computer and you're writing away and you see a news feed and you go off to that news feed and then you go off to another news feed and then you guys, and I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but I know some people do. And then they come back to what it is that they were doing and it can take 20 to 30 minutes for the, main, the brain to, 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 depending upon where you went and if you got agitated stress-wise reading that stuff, it can take quite a bit of time for you to come back. And then also the fact about multitasking. Uh, I used to claim that I was the best multitasker I knew. In reality, I wasn't because my brain can't multitask. If I'm carrying my garbage out to the backyard and I'm talking to my neighbor Carol while I'm doing it, that kind of multitasking is probably just fine. But if you want to use the executive functioning of the brain, it's impossible. So decision making, thinking, anything you need to use your cognitive capabilities with is greatly diminished whenever we do that. And the time it takes to come back to what you were doing um, is uh, considerable. And so your brain on stress, just as a little summary here, uh, there's two wings to the central nervous system, I often like to say. Uh, the sympathetic one is the one that you're probably all familiar with, that fight, flee, freeze, fawn is in that category now too. And that's the one that activates a neuroscientist at a conference one told, once told me, within a millisecond of your mind's perception of a threat. So somebody says something you don't like, the second you perceive that, which happens very quickly, all those hormones are running through your body. And generally, we feel that with, uh, in your body. We feel that. How many of you have a, a special place in your body that stress tends to get stored, like the neck, the shoulder, the belly, wherever it is? I call those your yellow flashing lights, and I call them that because they're like the early indicators. Sometimes they're a little later indicator, too. But sometimes we just have that funny feeling in our belly, right? Or there's a sense of, 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 uh, of um, not ease in the body, right? Maybe the shoulder hasn't really got tight yet. But if we can learn how to listen to our bodies, our bodies don't lie. And they oftentimes can give us early warnings to, whoa, slow down here. You need to take care of yourself a little bit. So that's the yellow flashing lights, the sympathetic. The other wing is the parasympathetic one. That's the one that takes a little bit more to activate. But it's a very natural, rhythmic process. Our stress system, most of us kind of go like this. When we get stuck into that sympathetic and aren't engendering that parasympathetic one as we can, was when we can get ourselves in, in trouble. And the reason that I asked you right out of the gate today was what brings about well-being in your life? The reason I ask that is because that's probably engaging your parasympathetic nervous system. Unless your well-being factor was drinking three martinis, which I hope it wasn't. So. <laughs> but, but the well-being factor here of, of knowing, knowing what brings about that sense of contentment and calm in your life is undoubtedly engaging your parasympathetic system. So you know how to do that. All right, the most important point on this slide is that well-being means learning how to care for yourself and your central nervous system. It's not the absence of stress. Can I say that again? Well-being is not necessarily the absence of stress or difficulties in our lives. It's our ability to live with them. It's a, an ability to care for ourselves, to nurture ourselves, to support ourselves, and often in relationships with others as well. The other thing I want to talk about is telomeres. Anyone familiar with telomeres here? Oh, good, okay. So yeah, the telomeres. I like to describe them, those of you who don't know them, as the end of a shoelace. And we're all old enough here to probably know what the end of those shoelaces used to look like. The little, uh, little it looked like clear tape, remember that? So that's like the protective quality at the end of a uh, chromosome. And stress, not eating well, not sleeping, uh, many, many different factors can erode at this. And it's a very natural process. Process. As we age, that's what happens. It's a natural consequence of being human. But there are things that we can do to slow down that, to mitigate uh, the rapidness of that uh, by caring for ourselves in many of these strategies that I've just talked about. And one of the strategies that, of course, you knew I was going to talk about is mindfulness. Uh, there's a lot of data behind mindfulness. 
At the center, mindfulness isn't a fad for us or something that we just started doing recently. We have been teaching, studying, and using mindfulness and research projects for over 20 years. Uh, we were one of the first people in the state to teach John Kabat-Zinn's program, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, and continue to do that and use that as our primary mode of our research. Um, and we see it so important that we actually put it right smack dab in the middle of that well-being model and really include it because it enriches, enlivens, and strengthens every one of the dimensions of well-being you see there. So I want to give you a definition because, as I said before, I think mindfulness is kind of ubiquitous. It's talked about a lot, uh, and there's many different descriptions of it. So the description I'm going to use is from, from uh, John Cabot Zen, who at the University of Massachusetts about 40 years ago created this program because he was really concerned. He was teaching in the medical school, and he was really concerned about all these people who were falling between the cracks. And so he designed a program taking mindfulness and yoga and over an eight-week course, teaching it to people. Um, I could tell you much more about how funny it was for him to finally get that program in there and all the hurdles he had to go through 40 years ago to do it, but let's just say we can be happy that he did it. Um, and this is one of his definitions. Uh, as I say this, I also want to give credit to the roots of mindfulness practice. Many of them come from Eastern traditions, including Buddhism and Hinduism. But I also want to suggest to you that if you look at most of the world's major religions, you will find contemplative practices that are extremely familiar to what we teach as mindfulness. Uh, so it's nothing new. And as a matter of fact, mindfulness is an innate capacity that every single one of you in this room have. And you know exactly what it feels like when you're all hands on deck, when you're feeling really present to what's happening in your life. And the research tells us that when we can really be all hands on deck or present or feeling grounded in this present moment, even if the situation is difficult, we will report enhanced sense of ease and well-being in our life because we're all there, right? So it's, uh, and this notion of present moment, you know, you think about that. Some people will say to me when they take a class, aren't we always in the present moment? Hello, you know, I'm here, I'm here. And yes, I suppose there's the legitimacy to that. But the researchers will also tell us that if you, and uh, many different studies like this have been done, but about 50% of the time they'll tell you that your attention is wandering. It's not right here, right now. And the attention is wandering generally to one of two places when we look at it, the past or the future or critiquing something here, and whatever it is. But we're not all right here. Uh, and there's also nothing wrong with learning from the past and doing good planning. Maybe some of you are strategic planners in this room. It doesn't matter. All that's fine. But when you're doing that, that's what you're doing. And when you're thinking about your past or journaling, that's what you're doing. You see what I'm getting at here? And, and so most of us, we, we'll call mindfulness a training of the mind. We call it, actually John calls it, a, a training of the heart as much as a training of the mind. It's an integrative approach of allowing ourselves to come home and it's training our mind, given all the 24-7 connectivity, you know, all the distractions, the external noise. Somebody said, I love that, right? All of that. It's hard sometimes to come home. So this is a training of the mind and the heart, the way that we approach it. And we use these attitudes, uh, attitudes of openness and curiosity. And you'll see that term there, a non-judgmental attitude. For many years, um, I helped create something called the Institute for Mindful Leadership. Some of you may know it started at General Mills. And whenever I'd talk to the executives about this non-judgmental attitude, they'd go, right, I'm paid to be a critical thinker. That's what I do, you know. Uh, analytical capabilities are really important to me. I do have a judgmental mind. I'm constantly critiquing and thinking about things. And I said, well, you can continue to do that. But I'm talking about something different here. I'm talking about discernment. So I want to, there's judgment and there's discernment. Discernment comes out of wisdom and generally a little pause. Judgment is oftentimes knee-jerk reaction, right? It's that quick stimuli, that, that uh, jumping into autopilot conditioning and thinking oftentimes, which doesn't, which doesn't allow us to broaden our perspective and bring in other perspectives, uh, a broadening in our thinking, etc. That non-judge or the judgmental attitude that John was referring to there, and suggesting that you have a non-judgmental attitude, also falls right in with the negativity bias that I talked about earlier. Right? 
our, our brain is constantly kind of scoping in that brain. So this brain of ours also has this incredible capacity to do so much else. So this also allows, perhaps most importantly, I hope you hear this, so that we can see the good in our lives, so that we can appreciate the beauty in life, the good in our lives, daily life, whatever, um, and, and instead of getting stuck in those places. So there's three elements of mindfulness that we often talk about. Intention is really important as a motivator. Attention, a lot of people think of mindfulness and all they think about is focus. But it's also this attitude that we bring. It's a kindness, a gentleness, a, a self-compassion. That's part of that non-judgmental. And for many people, it's just starting out playing every day with an openness and a curiosity. And I also like to mention that the research will tell us uh, what I like to refer to as mindfulness is also other-oriented. Many people think it's about me, me, me. <laughs> and in reality, the research will tell us that when we practice mindfulness in many different forms throughout our day, uh, we tend to be more empathetic of other people. Uh, compassion grows. Some will say because we've introduced maybe a bit more self-compassion, some doses of that in ourselves, it permits us to be compassionate to others or introduce that sense of empathy that when we're mindful, we're often able to see and respond to others with greater sensitivity and understanding. And there's a woman named Rhonda McGee, who's at the University of California, Berkeley, who's a lawyer, who's also a trained MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction instructor, who's written this lovely book uh, about using mindfulness for racial injustice and doing it as a community healing. And one of the things I love about this quote that I really want to bring out is much of our lives and throughout our day, we're reacting to external stimuli. You know, that's part of that chain that we get in, that autopilot. And what mindfulness does is perhaps even just a couple of moments throughout the day give us an opportunity to pause and to choose to respond uh, rather than being stuck in that as a, one of my... Uh, the students once told me, I feel like I'm stuck on a treadmill of life, right? Uh, we can laugh at that, but that we can get off that treadmill. Lots of evidence over 40 years now, because we've got a lot of it's using this MBSR program, which allows us to do pre and post. Um, and these are the primary findings. If I ask the lead researchers at the center, they'll say, well, reductions in stress. We know that that's first and foremost across the board, substantial research in that. And more importantly, over the past few years, there's been a lot of research in reductions in anxiety and depression. JAMA in 2022 had a study that showed uh, that uh, taking a, uh, an eight-week program of mindfulness-based stress reduction and practicing over that period of time, and by the way, the dosage of mindfulness meditation uh, can be 10 to 12 minutes a day. Uh, that program uh, is a little bit longer than that, but uh, that particular program and that research was saying that um, that program um, of the effect after eight weeks and then out six months as well um, had uh, similar results to taking uh, a very commonly well-known antidepressant drug. So I, one of the things I would never say to somebody is, go off your meds and meditate. Please don't do that. At the center, we view mindfulness and everything we're talking about as integrative approaches. But I just want to say the promise of this learning how to regulate our central nervous systems and to care for ourselves has a lot of power. Uh, and it has a ripple effect, not just only in our own lives, but in the lives of others as well. And as we age, the research, there is preliminary evidence that mindfulness meditation may improve attention, memory, executive functioning, processing speed. That's one of the things that maybe you know um, falters just kind of naturally over time as we age is the processing mechanism of our brains and general cognition. Uh, so preliminary results, and there's more and more being done. Um, there's also much more research probably on caretakers of people as we get older and the benefits of mindfulness in, in their stress reduction as well. So I'm going to bring in the telomeres photo again because regular meditation may also help to strengthen telomeres. Regular meditators over extended periods of time, there's been some research in that as well. So um, rather than talk about this, I was thinking of doing an exercise with you. Would you guys be okay with that? Yeah? Okay. So before we do that, I just want to show you this model because I want to ask you this question. 
How many of you have ever tried meditation and said, forget it? Because, you know, other people can do this, but my brain is like a 12-lane highway constantly going in every direction. Well, good news, because I want to tell you this. Although I'm going to lead you through this little exercise right afterwards, I'm going to show you some slides that are also going to show you that mindfulness can also be a practice that you do without having to meditate. Okay, so I just want, to, I want you to hear that. It can be, that muscle of mindfulness can be built a, a little bit more with a, um, how shall I say it, maybe a little easier with the practice of mindfulness meditation. It's not the quantity of time, by the way, it's the consistency of the practice that can build that muscle. But likewise, there's a, a, a famous mindfulness teacher who will say, uh, it's many moments, many times. So throughout our day, when I notice that I'm being distracted, I can bring my attention back, feel my hands on the wheel of the car, or when I'm sipping a cup of coffee, I can really taste the coffee that I'm drinking and the warmth of my hands in contact with the, this. Or when I'm walking outside, rather than ruminating about something, I can instead listen to the birds singing and notice today that the sky was blue and feel the wind against my skin. All of those things are training our minds and our attention intentionally to be here now. So there are many, many, many things that you can do throughout your day to cultivate this mindful awareness and just strengthen that innate capacity that we all have to be mindful, but that's so easy to forget or to let it dissipate uh, based on uh, stressors that we have in our daily lives. So how it generally works is we give ourselves something to pay attention to. In mindfulness, uh, we usually will use the body. There are many different forms of meditation, which maybe uh, if somebody wants to know about that, I can talk about that later. But basically, let me just say that mindfulness is about um, an awareness of your body. We use the breath, the felt sense of the body, because the body and breath are always in the present moment. How's that? They're a free tool. It's always here. So that's what we will access as our tool. And for most of you who have ever tried meditating or maybe you're regular meditators, you'll notice, yep, I'm following that in-breath. I'm guiding. I'm doing just what I'm supposed to do. And all of a sudden, I go to the grocery list. Did I? What did I forget? Oh, shoot, I forgot that. Oh, and... You know, why is it me who always has to pick up the bread and the milk? Oh, yeah, and, and did I remember all oh, that email? You guys following me? You get off, and then you're, whoa, and then you realize it, and what a lot of... So what I want to say is losing focus is normal. That's what the brain does. It loves to wander off. It loves shiny objects. It loves all that. So you're not a bad meditator. All that we do is we regain focus, but that's the hard part because usually when we've lost our focus and our attention, we'll do this. I'm the worst meditator in the world. Everybody else is all blissed out and knows how to do this, and I'm the worst meditator in the world. That's usually what happens when we lose focus. That's where that non-judgmental attitude and that little bit of kindness and maybe a sense of humor comes in. And when we notice that we've done that, we escort our attention back. Just to, oh yeah, I feel my feet on the floor. Oh yeah, let's start again. Oh yeah, that's an out breath I'm on now. Okay, I got that. So that regaining focus. And here's the secret that most people don't know. What builds the muscle of mindfulness is intentionally choosing to come back. Each time you come back, you're building the muscle. It's not a problem. It's part of the process. And that coming back choosing to come back and letting that thought go or letting whatever it is or when you're walking and you're listening to the birds and it's lovely and then your attention wanders off and then you feel the wind and you notice the wind and then you feel your foot on the floor all that's coming home again and again do you see what i'm getting at here that's mindfulness that's that ability that we have, but we often forget about to train our minds, to train our minds and our hearts for the benefit of enhanced well-being and resilience. Right? Does this make sense? Okay. So, I'm, we, this will only be an hour-long meditation. <laughs> I just thought I'd see if you were still awake. Okay. So, let's all just settle into a comfortable position. It can be helpful to have your feet on the floor. And by the way, um, if you're not comfortable doing this, I'm going to invite you to just sit in silence for a little bit. When do you ever get that, right? Just quiet. But 
let's just start with uh, settling in and this will just be just a couple of minutes, just to, to a little sampling. And l let your hands rest wherever they comfortably do. You can close your eyes if that feels comfortable. If that doesn't feel comfortable, soft gaze of the eyes, maybe just at a spot in front of you. Um, if you're looking around the room, it can busy the thinking process, that's all. And just beginning maybe by taking a couple of deeper, fuller in-breaths and out-breaths. And with each out breath, just gently allowing it to release all the way out. And with that, maybe just letting go of all that's been, all the words, thoughts of the day, thoughts of tomorrow. And just arriving right here, right now, as best you can. Through a felt sense of sitting here now. Maybe feeling the feet in contact with the floor, the pressure points of the feet in contact with the floor. Or maybe noticing uh, just the felt sense of the weight of the body being held and supported by the, the pews you're sitting in now. Gravity at work. Maybe noticing the felt sense of the back of the legs and the thighs in contact with the wood of the pew or the cushion. And how your back is just resting, being held by the pew. And maybe just taking another deeper, fuller in-breath and out-breath and allowing the body to settle maybe just a bit more. And then when you're ready, just allowing any of those deeper breaths to just recede into the background for now. And allowing the body's uh, ability, it just knows exactly how to breathe. So just stepping back and maybe noticing the wisdom, kind of miraculous capabilities of this body to know just how to breathe. And stepping back a bit and just observing that felt sense of how the body just expands a bit with the in-breath. And there's that natural letting go of the out-breath. It's like a wave, a rhythmic quality. And when you notice that your attention's been called away to a thought or a memory, an opinion, whatever it may be, just smile at it, maybe seeing it as a cloud in the sky and just letting it pass. And then come home again to the felt sense of the body sitting here, simply breathing, being, allowing that doing nature of ours to just sit to the side for now and come home to being here now. And now if you'd like, just gently Maybe allowing the body as a whole to be known again. Maybe holding it in your mind's eye. And just allowing your attention to move through the body as a warm light. We often hold so much stress and bracing and tension uh, in our body. It's really normal. Just maybe give ourselves an opportunity to just move through the body starting with the face the muscles of the face around the corners of the eyes, the jaw, the chin, the back of the head, the neck, the shoulders, and just inviting as best you can a sense of ease in the body as a warm light of awareness. And when your attention moves away, just come home again to the body now moving down to the arms, the fingers, the hands. 
And again, softening in as best you can to tension, holding, bracing, a softening into, inviting ease. And then moving to the front torso from the top of the shoulders, that right and left shoulder. So many of us hold tension there. Moving down the front torso and the back as well. Inviting ease. And then moving through the hips and the lower pelvic region and the sit bones. Noticing what's present without having to judge anything. We're often not so kind to our bodies. Maybe offering a sense of gratitude, a warmth as you soften into as best you can. And then moving down through the thighs, the longest bone in the body, the femur bone here in the thighs, the muscles. Moving on to the knees and the lower legs, the ankles and the feet. Really feeling the feel of the feet in contact with the floor, the earth. And taking a moment to just hold the body as a whole, simply sitting here, breathing, being. And maybe taking a moment to offer a sense of gratitude, appreciation for this body that does the best it can day in and day out for us. And then maybe bringing that sense of gratitude out into the world, thinking of people extending a sense of gratitude, appreciation for those people in your life who bring about well-being, who maybe have supported you in one way or another through your life. Just a moment of gratitude maybe including pets, circumstances, situations, whatever feels appropriate for you. And then when you're ready, taking in a deeper, fuller in-breath and out-breath. And just pausing for a moment before we bring this meditation to a conclusion to just notice the overall quality and condition of your body, mind, and heart in this moment. And maybe feeling the feet on the floor, pressing the feet into the floor. And when you're ready, opening your eyes slowly. And when you're ready, just looking around the room. And maybe above and below and behind you as well. Maybe doing a little stretch. Thank you for joining me on that exercise. Um, I want to get your comments on that. But before I do that, I also uh, want to just leave you with this quote from... Uh, Victor Frankl, it's actually an adaptation of his quote that freedom is the ability to pause between stimulus and response and in that pause to choose. I sometimes will take out the word freedom and put the word mindfulness in there, right? Mindfulness is this ability to pause. And I just want to remind you that there are formal ways of practicing mindfulness like this exercise we just did, but there are many, many informal practices. And um, one of my favorite is one that was with a, a friend and colleague of mine, Janice Monterino, who used to be a, a, a lawyer with General Mills. She headed up their legal division, as a matter of fact. She used to have people do what she called purposeful pauses uh, whenever they gathered for a meeting just as a way to come home uh, to that moment. And there are many others as well. But I think I'm just going to wrap that for now and just ask you if there was a word or a phrase that you noticed when you were doing that 
meditation, what did you notice? What did you notice in that exercise? You noticed your heartbeat. Was there a flavor? Was there a sense? Anybody get tired? Notice they were drowsy? How many of us think that we're sleep deprived? So you close the eyes and what does the body want to do? Yippee, finally they're letting me sleep. So that's a very common experience when we meditate to get that drowsy feeling. So uh, very normal and what we do is we'll just change the time of day. It's a little difficult. I was just thinking, it's cold, it's dark, and yippee, I'm going to have a meditate. Yeah. So that's very natural that you'd get a little drowsy. So the time that you do it and if your eyes are closed, maybe opening them can help with that too. And that gets a little better over time. Anybody notice a whole lot of thoughts? Pretty normal if you did, pretty natural. We call this a practice and we call it a training, right? Because it takes a while to cultivate that ability to, to, uh, to make friends with those thoughts. Maybe not make friends, but let them go. Other experiences or other questions you might have just about anything that I talked about. I think we're moving into the Q&A now if you're okay with that. Questions or comments? I got you all tired now on that. Please. So, as I was doing that, one thing that occurred to me is trying to think about what the intrinsic value is of, in a sense, nothingness. Because what it mm. seems that part of it, while we're trying to draw attention into the body and how it connects to, to Earth, what we're really also saying, it seems, is how to get experiences of our life away from us for a while oh as opposed to it, and wanting to have just and, and wanting to your voice carries really can everyone hear him have you been able to hear good and, good and wanting to have just the interior body and so i'm wondering what the research would say Well, I would say that um, that's really interesting. I, I want to say this first, that mindfulness meditation is not about learning how to bliss out. You, you might get super relaxed. How, did anyone feel relaxed in that exercise we just did and feel a little blissy? Yeah, okay. Well, there's a, that's, you engaged your parasympathetic nervous system, no doubt, when you were doing this, right? You, you slowed things down a little bit. But mindfulness meditation is actually about learning to, to pay attention intentionally so you were coming into your body and in doing that all those other maybe thoughts that were coming around they were at bay you're not really you know you held them at bay so that you could focus your attention and notice the quality of what it felt like to be here and the benefits maybe of inviting a little bit of ease in your body when you notice the stress, when you notice the tightening. Did any of you notice you were able to kind of loosen some of the grip, even just a tiny little bit, you know, when you invited a, a ease there? So that's part of it. I think that one might say enhancing a sense of peace or tran tranquility, if you were going to give it an intrinsic quality. Um, I would think that many people who meditate over time say that it provides a sense of equilibrium or balance in their life. And rather than blissing out, for me personally, I have found that what mindfulness has allowed me to do is to be more present in my life, to be more present to the people I love, to, the work, you know, to what I'm doing. I'm more here. Uh, and and that, that benefit of the quieting of the mind while I'm meditating is comes out into your life then. It has a ripple effect, if I can say it that way. Thank you. Does this help, Paul? Okay. Other questions? Anybody? Oh, please. Yeah? Well, something you just said reminded me of a conversation I had with my brother recently. Um, we all had children at about the same time, and he was talking about a house he lived in in St. Paul, and I don't remember the house. And so... It just really bothers me, but yet we had children under five at that time. And there's so many things in my life I can't remember from 1996 till about 2005. And that's when 
I was getting married and having children and moved into a new house and I was working full time. And I do remember just trying to get to the end of the day. Yes. And then the next Did you hear morning, the laughter? The people were <laughs> laughing at you. They were knowing no, exactly know. what you were talking about. Yeah. And I remember I was teaching at Dunwoody and I remember I still remember I had class at 7:30. I was late every day. I was breastfeeding in a, you know, in the only woman on staff and it was just horrible. And when my brother, I mean there was just so much horridness. But when my brother, he's like, yeah, you were at that house. And I still, I just can't remember it. So what you just said really reminds me that I thought I was present for my kids, but I don't think I was. And that makes me really sad. Or, or maybe you were present to your kids. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're not, not remembering re being at, yeah, exactly. Okay, we I'm going to go with that. Yeah, I, I, well, you can go with that if you want. But what I'm trying to say is that I think Many times throughout our life, we test our resilience, right? And who, isn't, who hasn't been a parent of young children that hasn't tested their resilience, right? And so that's the capacity of this body, you know, to do what's in front of us that needs to be done. And that's the gratitude we can have for the resilience we had to get us through that. And that we can't be all things to all people. We are human beings. And, and as such, we're going to go through periods like that. And that well-being model, I show those six dimensions to some people, and they're like, people actually get balance in those areas of their lives, you know? And, and think about it. At different stages and ages of your life, every one of those little six dimensions is going to vary, right? And your capacity to practice mindfulness in different ways. Um, there's a, we have a member of our family who just had a little baby, three months old, and um, she says, my mindfulness practice these days is cooking and do filling the bottle and when I hold the baby. And she told me this, and I was like, yeah. And then I took care of the baby for a weekend. I have to say it's one of the most mindful experiences I've ever had of my whole life. I'm including my retreats that I've gone on, right? Because there I was with that baby. So I think we have to be really careful about how we, we judge ourselves because I think every, how many of us can relate to this story, by the way? Yeah, every, yeah, I mean, you're not alone in this. And, and so we kind of pick and choose sometimes and we get through with the resilience we have in our bodies and we care for ourselves in different ways at different times in our lives. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense because I remember when my mom was dying of cancer too. Yeah. When you're holding a baby And in this part of the world, you know, we look at busyness and having full lives as like a good thing. Hello? A little, you know, a little, a little overboard. And so for many of us, I think part of aging, at least I've been discussing this with some people, is knowing that letting go and, and so that you have more space to, to be and, and that's a gift that maybe you don't have when you've got five little kids running around. Yeah. Other questions? Oh. I'm also happy to take comments, too, because some of you um, may be practitioners and have some things you want to talk about, too. So just to follow up a little bit on what Anna was talking about, I'm, it, it brings me back to something you said about the mind cannot multitask. And yeah. I wonder if... Mm. What mm. Anne's really talking about is ultimate mindfulness because, mm. you know, memory is a whole different subject that right. we go on for hours. But if the memory can only hold what you're principally focused on, it, it, it suddenly makes sense to me that there might be other parts of our life at a particular time that have fallen away because we were focused on something in particular. Yeah, this could be a whole other topic. Uh, but, yeah, I also think it's prioritizing and choosing right, what's important, and, and letting go, and sometimes we can't let go of all those activities in our lives. I think there's a couple, there's one here and over there. Yeah, let's do there and then. Speaks to the connection between 
mindfulness and being in the presence of God or in the state of oh, grace? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, at the, the way that we teach mindfulness at the center is what we'll call a secular approach. We don't attach a religion to it. It's the same way. Um, that's why I gave credit to where the roots of it are from. And I can talk more about that if you want. But I'll just say that many, many people that I know uh, come to mindfulness um, to learn it as a meditation and find that their relationship with God is greatly enhanced or whatever their spiritual life is becomes enhanced um, because there's a softening into their heart and an opening up to something bigger than themselves. Um, if you want to broadly describe spirituality um, as an experience of being connected with something larger than oneself, and I'll do that. Um, and that for many people, that's God. For many people, that's religions. For some people, it's nature, you know, all those things. But many people will report, including myself, a much, much deeper, richer spiritual life based on uh, a contemplative practice like mindfulness. And as I said earlier, if you look at most of the world's religions, you will find practices of mindfulness as a way to communicate with God, right? Or to connect in a deeper spiritual way. Does that make sense? Okay. People who practice yoga, by the way, will say that too, right? It's that calming of the mind and heart. And when we, we do that, we're able to connect maybe a little bit more clear. I think there was someone here, and then we'll come over there. As you were talking about um, being, being, in the, being present, um, like during the death of a parent or someone close to you, it seems to me that that is actually the essence of mindfulness. Yes. You're really connected Beautifully at said. that moment to that issue. And other things aren't as important. Yes, like raising children. Right. That there's a sense that that all your attention is on that particular moment. And isn't that mindfulness? That is mindfulness. As a matter of fact, do, you, do any of you know who Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was? Yeah. Death and Dying. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross once was in an interview that I heard, and she was asked, well, you know, the way that you are with dying children and your presence and the way that you do that, I've been, this was somebody who had been following her for a while as a student or something said, and I'm, I'm sure you must have a meditation practice because you have to. How could you possibly do what you do? How long have you been meditating? And she said, I don't meditate. I've never meditated in my life. But what I can tell you that I do is that when I'm at the bed of a patient or a child who's dying, I am all there. I am right with that children. I can feel that child's breath. I'm, I'm breathing with that child's breath. And if that's what meditation, if that's what mindfulness is, I guess I do it, but I intrinsically do it. This is what, I'm so glad you said that, because I led you through that exercise just as a way to remember that flavor that you have, that capacity. And if it was difficult for you tonight, that makes sense, you know, all the rest of that. But I really, really want you to hear that mindfulness is something that we all know about. It's innate. We've all experienced it. And we can cultivate it in all sorts of ways, just like you described, just like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. It's an innate capacity that she's strengthened intentionally. Do you notice I keep using that word? Intentionally paying attention with an attitude of openness and curiosity and kindness. That's what she did. She practiced mindfulness, but she would never have called it meditation. As a matter of fact, she went on later to say, I don't like to meditate. <laughs> but she did every day of her life, right there at the bedside with those children. Somebody here, too. I just wanted to follow up because um, I got into mindfulness four years ago. I took mm -hmm. um, mindfulness-based dementia care oh, cool. from Michelle Barkley. Oh, good. And I just have to say, it completely saved my life. Mm -hmm. um, and there is so much about it. There's so m you know, I've read a lot of John Kabat-Zinn's books. And, getting, and what's been so interesting to me about his writing and his teachings is he never mentions the word spirituality or God. And yet, I, that is what 
I've gotten out of it is such a connection with God. To your point, you know, to follow up with that, um, that's sort of the internal intentional gift that I got that I didn't get from a book. I didn't get from the teachings, but it has really saved my life. Mm -hmm. My sister has Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. and it it is a practice. Yeah, <laughs> because we're not perfecting. It's not <laughs> life or death. You know, right yeah. now it's it's right. constant caregiving. That's beautiful. And so it's constant, yeah. and the practice is just that. It has saved my life. Mm. So thank you. Um, that, that notion of connecting with something bigger than ourselves and people's relationships and their religious practices getting stronger. Um, contemplative prayer will do the same thing. Many of you are probably familiar with that, but um, yes, that's not an unusual story I hear. When people give themselves time to remember, oh, I can come home, I, that's really empowering and powerful. We probably got time for one more question if somebody has one. Well, a couple of the things that I want to remind everybody of is probably by tomorrow that uh, tape will be up on our website. So anyone that missed this that you think would benefit from them, uh, direct them to the website. And Marianne has brought some, you know, wonderful materials on mindfulness from the University of Minnesota. And if you didn't get them on the way in, they're on the table on the way out. And remember, I see all the baked goods that we spent so much time baking. So please, please get those on the way out and uh, take a time of fellowship. The building closes at midnight, so uh, we'll need to be out of here by then. So thanks again, everyone. for oh, what, what? Hold on. Oh, no, no. On the church's website. It's under next chapter. And it also has all of our other taped presentations from Alan Page and Will Steger and a bunch of others, so it's very good. There's also a little card out there, just a little card about this size that has a list of everyday mindfulness practices that I, I didn't, that might be really helpful for you too, so make sure you grab that. Yep. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marianne. All right, well, great presentation. As of right now, we're, we're taking a little pause on next chapter. We're going to gather as a group to decide where we go from here. So stay tuned. It'll be on the website. Thanks, yep. Thanks guys.